Good afternoon. This is Adrienne Payne Andrews, and I'd like to welcome you to the Healthy Communities Initiative webinar, Developing Annual Plans and Benchmarks Using Smart Objectives. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. First, all of your phone lines are muted to reduce background noise. Please make sure to use your audio pin so that your lines can be unmuted to, in, to participate in discussion. Also, please make sure your computer speakers are turned off or muted if you have dialed in using your phone. This helps eliminate background noise. New to the webinar this month, we have posted the webinar slides on the Healthy Communities Initiative SharePoint calendar, should you want to print them off and take notes throughout the webinar. Um, for this webinar, we're also experimenting with a polling option. So please listen for directions related to this throughout the webinar. Finally, we are recording the webinar and will archive it on SharePoint. Our presenters today are Jeff Usher with Kansas Health Foundation, Scott Wittick with the Center for Community Support and Research, and Claudia Hombaum with Kelsey Kids Challenge. Our purposes are to discuss upcoming grant requirements, specifically the grant status report and annual plan, the 50% match, uh, implementation grant applications for HCI2 teams, and the annual report for HCI1 teams. We will also spend quite a bit of time talking about how community change framework actions can be used to develop smart objectives to help leadership teams implement a productive, efficient, and effective plan that moves your policy authority forward. Time will be set aside for questions. We will pause for questions during the webinar as well as the polling option I mentioned. Um, but feel free to type any questions you have into the chat box on the right side of your screen, and Sean will be keeping track of questions as they come in. At the end of the webinar, Carolyn Dunn with Stafford County will share comments prepared for the webinar on adaptive leadership. And we will close with announcements and upcoming events and due dates. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jeff. Hello, everybody. Um, it took me a little bit when uh, Adrian said uh, good afternoon because I'm in San Diego, California, and it's still morning. So uh, good morning from sunny Cal Southern California. Um, I will be heading home uh, later this afternoon, so I'm heading back to Kansas. Um, really, my I think my purpose for being on the call is to help clarify if, if there needs any, to be any clarifications, the reporting uh, process, the proposal process, um, and the development of the annual plans as far as the technical things, when they are due, and those kinds of things. And, the, and of course, the 50% match uh, that we sent out in all of the uh, amended grant agreements. Um, so so um, the, the, in, bo in both cases, um, as far as the grant status report, annual plan, and the proposals, we're, we'll be asking the communities to simply to fill in on a Word document that we've sent out in the, in the the amended agreements uh, to describe the policy priority, and then outline smart objectives around the community change framework. So I, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Each of the sections there, you can fill out uh, uh, smart objectives for each of those sections. And of course, uh, Scott and Claudia will go into more detail around smart uh, objectives um, uh, later on in this presentation. You can go ahead and advance the slide. I am having trouble advancing, so give me one second. So um, the HCI2 implementation grant application, which is really the, the plan, but it also includes all of the information we need in a proposal. So that's why we ask, if that's why it's really different. Um, so we're, we're going to ask um, basically who the organization or the fiscal sponsor for the, the, the agreement is going to be, um, the total request and funding amount. Of course, there's a budget sheet there to, to fill in the budget. And then the annual uh, plan with the SMART objectives. Um, uh, that will be basically the same that we've asked the Healthy Communities Round 2 uh, folks to, uh, to, to uh, uh, submit. So this just becomes a plan and a proposal in one document. As, I, as we had mentioned at the October convening, we wanted to make it as easy as possible. And this is going to be due in short 
turnaround, but but I think you've been working with a lot of the, the TA providers, and this this is due at the, the first of April. And the, for the uh, HCI one communities, the annual report is re really basically a it's going to it'll suffice as a grant status report. Um, uh, it, but it's really the annual plan. Um, plus, well, so that so you'll 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 fill out the the, the uh, annual plan as we described before with the policy priority, the objectives, smart objectives around uh, the community change framework to move your policy priority, uh, and then you will also um, be asked to to um, uh, so you'll you'll submit a word document on August first that. Uh, uh, to to uh, uh, Gina Hess, at gr the the grants manage, uh, management uh, coordinator at the foundation, uh, and then and 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 then uh, you will also do. We I think we sent out. I'm sure we sent out on the on the uh, agreements amended agreements a link, and there'll be a, a link that you go to to answer some questions around lessons learned, anticipated outcomes, uh, steps to ensure sustainability uh, beyond the grant. Grant and uh, to what extent objectives um, have been met in the reporting period. This needs to be just very brief. It doesn't need to be extensive. Um, it is an online one, so you'll submit that too. So there'll be two things that'll be due um, on on August first. It'll be the the plan itself, and then those um, there's the 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 electronic link uh, that you'll submit online. And so the 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 fifty percent match um, we I think we, we we described it in the in the the amended grant agreements um, which you can refer to again but uh, with grant round one we we stated that we wanted a cash match and there are a number of different ways in which we you could look at a cash match uh, but as we as we um, as communities worked on their policy priorities we realized that we were becoming pretty narrow and it was going to be Maybe hard to justify other grant funds coming in to actually meet a specific policy priority. So we also um, uh, decided that we will we will accept uh, any documentation from an organization that that basically says they will offer uh, staff time um, um, for the for the the match. And that staff time basically will be we ask that it be directed by. Uh, the leadership team in the communities. So if it's a so so the, the so the work would be in co in coordinating with the leadership team. And that person would help support the leadership team uh, for that period of time, and that time will count as part of the 50% match. Um, and those those uh, are due for uh, the, the HCI one or two communities on the, the same day that the the uh, 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 proposal and plan are on uh, the first of uh, of April, uh, and then for a HCI one communities, it's different. It's we need it on June first because because we want to be able to cut the check for the community implementation, the second two year or the second year of the implementation um, on uh, in July. So we'll need that in June to be able to cut that check in July. And all we need from that again, we need a letter from. Um, the, if it's a if it's a per, if, if it's a match where the a cash match, how that cash match has come up, and 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 if it's uh, for time, we we will need a letter or documentation from whoever the, the supervisor is of that particular employee that, that those dollars will or those those that time will go towards supporting the policy priority for the leadership team. So with that, that's basically, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, the other thing I want to make clear, people have felt comfortable calling me and asking me questions about the cash match, and I'd be happy to, to, to do that. I think Sean would be happy as well, or Adrian and, 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 and anybody on the TA team. Um, but feel free to contact me, email me, uh, give me a phone call, and I would be happy to talk to you about that if there's some challenges with that. Um, our goal is that all the communities will continue to work on this, uh, which we think very important work, and we think everyone's doing a great job, and we want to keep this going. So, questions? Yes, we do have a couple of questions. Um, okay. One is, I uh, just want to make sure that the match we are documenting by April 1 is for the coming year only. We'll show the remainder of the year's matches in subsequent years, right? 
Correct. Uh, you can do it w w uh, one of two ways. We have had some uh, communities have already provided documentation for the 50% match for the entire implementation uh, period, but all we require is that you er annually uh, submit that because we know that things change. Uh, but we, so we want to ensure that annually you can, and, and you may have been able to receive 50% match this year, but you haven't quite got it for the next implementation year, so it gives you time to work on that. So it can be either, either or. You can provide a document that, that, that uh, commits the match over the entire implementation, or you could do it uh, annually. And we'll, as, as uh, the HCI-1 communities, they've already submitted their match and they've worked a year, they're submitting their second match, uh, if they haven't already committed for the entire implementation. Okay. Um, the next question is, um, the 4-1 deadline for the application, is that new? We thought this was due along with the report in August. Could you re read that again? Sure. It's, the question is, is the 4-1 of the April 1st deadline for the application new? We thought this was due along with the report in August. Uh, the report in August, I mean, um, if it's the HCI-1 community, if it's HCI-1 communities, there's nothing due on April 1st. Okay. The HCI-2 communities have both the proposal and the 50% match due on the 1st because that's the end of their um, uh, planning grant. So I hope yeah. that's clear. clear. There, so there, for the HCI-1 uh, uh, teams, Everything's due either June 1st for the 50% match, or August um, uh, 1st for the for the the plan, the the next annual plan, and then uh, for the HCI 2, everything's due on April 1st. Okay. Um, another question is: We are submitting our application under a community foundation. The same foundation is offering a uh, cash match. The letter from the foundation needs to be submitted to state the amount of cash match per year, and then some match will come from partner agencies. Does each agency need to submit a letter uh, stating the amount? Well, what we need is documentation. If, if the community foundation provides uh, you know, a portion of the match, we need a letter from them. If someone else is providing another portion of the match, we need a letter from them. So we just need documentation that the entire uh, uh, match is, is, ha has been committed. And it can be first year, like like I said earlier, uh, or the entire um, implementation phase. I hope that's clear. Yes, that does clarify. Thank you. And that is all the questions um, that have come in so far. Well, thank you, Jeff, very much. And if there are additional questions, uh, please feel free to raise them, and we'll try and address them at the end of the webinar, or always reach out to Jeff or others um, after the webinar. Thank you. Why SMART objectives? As many of you know, developing SMART objectives takes time, careful planning, and a clear understanding of the outcomes you hope to achieve. Kansas Health Foundation is asking HCI teams to develop SMART objectives that form a strong, cohesive plan around the community change framework. The plan is intended to guide your work and to help determine progress. The intent is that the plan is useful to you and helps you to be more, even more effective in creating an environment supportive of your policy priority. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Claudia. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's start here. Something you've seen, been using, should be very familiar with by now, the community change framework. Here's where the work of HCI starts, lives, and ends in the four components of the community change framework. I think you all recognize by now that the community change framework gives us our purpose, and that is to create an environment that supports community health policies. Right now, it's time to look at how we can develop a strong strategic plan for our actions in order to have the most effective outcomes for our policy priorities. The way to do that is with creating SMART objectives. Whether you have experience writing SMART objectives or not, this web webinar is about connecting the dots with how to use community change framework actions to write SMART objectives. 
By doing so, you create a plan with actions that are productive, effective, and efficient in moving your policy priority forward. Next slide. Okay, the next slide is an equation, which is A plus B is equal to C. You can think of it as in this way, an equation for the best potential in moving your policy priority forward, in creating an environment supportive of the policy, in creating healthier options, in getting more people engaged in the healthy changes. So the outcome of A, the Community Change Framework, plus B, SMART Objectives, is equal to a productive, effective, efficient plan that leads to forward progress in our communities with policies that support healthy living. Yes? You are asked to write SMART Objectives for your Community Change Framework activities. I think everyone understands that by now. For a moment, let's just return to the timeline of when you are to write them. If you're an HCI 2 team, you are writing them for your upcoming April 1 implementation grant application. And if you're an HCI 1 team, you are writing them for your August report. Beyond the initial draft that both HCI 1 and 2 will write for those timelines, you will continue writing, revising, and using SMART objectives throughout the implementation grant. You might ask, why will you continue writing, revising, and using SMART objectives? Keep in mind the purpose of the SMART objectives. They aren't just words on a paper. Think of them as a way to form a cohesive plan with effective, efficient actions to move your policy priority forward. We don't expect for you to know everything that will happen in this next year or know all of the circumstances, so it will be important for you to continue writing and revising your objectives. Next slide, Scott. So in thinking about SMART objectives and forming a, a cohesive plan, um, you may begin to ask yourself uh, individually and uh, collectively as your core team works on developing your SMART objectives, your core team and potentially others, these types of questions to help clarify and or identify your SMART objectives. And they're the, just the simple what, why, who, when, and how type questions. Um, I would suggest in thinking about the development of your SMART objectives to uh, have that core group begin and or others begin to brainstorm possible objectives utilizing these types of questions. Uh, recognizing that you're drafting them, um, but that your hope is to get to a finished product, obviously. Maybe then ask two or three people after you've met as a core team to draft those uh, ideas or responding to these types of questions. Ask two or three people to finalize or wordsmith them uh, so that they can be strongly worded SMART objectives that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. And then taking it back to the final fold group for uh, an overall approval or direction for your set of SMART objectives. Again, using these types of questions as a beginning guide for your discussion. Next slide. So SMART objectives, what does uh, SMART stand for? And again, some of you may be uh, familiar with the acronym. So I just want to touch upon what each of those letters stand for. First of all, uh, specific. And this really helps the team uh, develop a clear vision and so that the plan can work efficiently and effectively. I often think of a specific objective as something that you can visualize. Uh, you can literally close your eyes and see that objective being carried out. 
Therefore, uh, I would suggest avoiding words that are catchy or that are um, uh, uh, words that you might use even in a grant application. So these are words like mobilize or catalyst or build the capacity or enhance. While these are catchy phrases or words, they're actually trigger words that leave open what is actually being done. Rather than those kind of catchy words of mobilize or catalyst or building the capacity, you might want to be more specific in using words like we are going to hold, we are going to meet, we are going to distribute X number, we're going to send, we're going to create. Those words, when you close your eyes, you can begin to visualize what the people who are either on the core team or your other partners on your coalition or in the community are actually doing. They're more specific, the actions being taken. Measurable. This simply allows your team to, to measure progress. Are we making a difference? It usually includes a, a number of so, some sort. How many, how much? How will we know that at the end of six months or a year or whatever the time bound that we put on ourselves that we achieved what we originally set out to do? So is it measurable? The third uh, letter is, stands for attainable or achievable. And uh, this is really needs to be defined by where your team is at given their resources and the support that is available. Um, this really gets, um, it needs discussion among that core team or others to really think and be realistic in that six month period or in that time bound that you set. Are, are we being realistic with ourselves? We might stretch ourselves as a group or as a community um, but at the same time, is it, a, is it truly achievable? R stands for is it relevant? And as Claudia mentioned earlier, a real focus on the community change framework. And I think this is particularly with that simple formula of the community change framework plus smart objectives, the relevant question really comes into play. You should be able to answer how does this objective relate to our HCI policy priority, our community change framework action? It should be a direct link. It shouldn't be a wandering link of, well, if we do this, we might catch a few people who might be interested. Uh, it needs to be a direct link to your community change framework and therefore your identified policy priority. Finally, the T stands for time bound, and it specifically states a month or a day to year in which that objective will be completed. Um, in many ways, the time bound aspect is a bit of a gimme in that all objectives should have a date, a clear date uh, associated with. So I'll turn it back to Claudia for the next uh, slide, which. Uh, goes into a, a bit more detail uh, around the area of being specific. So now let's take a closer look at the SMART objectives connected to the Community Change Framework. And the first attempt at drafting something as a SMART objective. Just for the purpose of today's webinar, we're using community events as an example. Although we could talk about SMART objectives in different ways, Today, we chose to give examples by focusing on community events. A majority of teams have talked about using everything from health fairs to 5Ks or chamber coffees as a way to reach a greater number of community members. So using community events gives us some very concrete examples of how to talk about smart objectives, objectives that are meaningful, productive, effective, and efficient. However, and this is very important, that by using events as an example, we are not suggesting that teams should think of the event as the only way to write objectives or take 
community change framework action. So let's start talking about those F words, the specifics. As you look at the top of the slide, you can see one of the technical aspects in writing objectives is that it meets the first criteria of specific by using verbs that provide clarity. Examples of verbs that provide clarity are provide, train, publish, increase, decrease, schedule, or purchase. And Scott mentioned some of these when he was talking. As compared to verbs that are vague and hard to measure, such as coordinate, partner, support, and enhance, also things that Scott had mentioned. So let's look at the example of this first draft that we have done below at the bottom of the screen. By September 2014, partner with organizations to coordinate education at community events. Is it vague? I think that you would all agree that it is. Does it, what does it really tell you to do? Written in this way, is it really clear? Writing the perf object, perfect objective doesn't matter. What does matter is does it help you understand the work and what you need to do. This example, this first draft of the objective, is a little like going down the track, as you see in the image beside it, without really being able to see where you are clearly going. Next slide. OK, we're going to try our first poll, first ever webinar poll for, for you today. And on this slide, what you will see is that we've taken that first objective draft and have attempted to be more specific. In doing so, we've created two slightly different versions, A and B. This is just our first step in creating greater clarity. We'd like for you to look at each version, A and B, and vote for the one you think create greater clarity as the first step in writing a smarter objective. Now, when we start the poll, we think that the survey, the results, will cover up the screen. So we want you to give you some time to look at A and B to determine what you think is the, the objective, the sample objective that gives you the greatest clarity before we launch the poll. A is by September 2014, meet with organizations to increase collaboration during community events. B, by September 2014, meet with organizations to identify community events and schedule activities. We'll give you just a few seconds to look at that. And Adrian, I think you can launch the poll now. So if you're in front of the screen, simply choose A or B. If you are on a phone, you will not be able to participate. That is, if you are on only a phone and not in front of a computer. OK, has everyone had a chance to vote by now? And Adrian, are we able to open the poll now? OK, the poll is closed.
And we have 95% indicated B and 5% A. 85% of the participants voted. Okay. The correct answer is B, and 95% of you have the correct answer. I know that you all realize that neither objective is totally smart. If we look at them, both versions are time bound. They all both say by September 2014. However, in B, the example in B, we have used the technical. That is, that we have used the verbs that give more clarity so that it does identify that a calendar will be created and activities planned, which says more than collaboration in A. What does collaboration really mean? But we know it's not totally smart, so what is missing? And Scott, would you like to talk about that? Sure, as we move to the next slide, and again, we're going to take a poll in a few minutes. As Claudia mentioned, we now have a kind of our next draft of this uh, objective, again, reading by September 2014, meet with organizations to identify community events and schedule activities. I know you realize the objective still isn't uh, quite there to that smart level yet. It's not polished quite enough. So as you consider the current draft of the SMART objective, in a few minutes we'll ask for another poll and we'll give you a, a few seconds to identify which of the components are still missing. Does there need to be more, does it need to be more specific or greater clarity? Does it need to be measurable or attainable? Is it relevant? Is it time bound? So on this poll, you'll be able to choose uh, multiple options when Adrian opens it up here in a minute. And just like on the last poll, the screen will switch to the poll. So I'm going to give you just a minute if you have a piece of scratch paper or something, to write down your answers, and then I'll let Adrian open the poll. Okay, Adrian, you want to open the second poll? And again, you should have that quick poll question in front of you. Choose all the components that are still missing. And again, you should be able to select multiple options. And we'll give you uh, a minute or so to respond. Okay, I'm going to ask that we close the poll. Hopefully that gave everybody enough time to answer. And uh, Adrian, again, if you're able to uh, give us the results. Sure. Uh, we had 70% that said it needed more clarity. 75% uh, clicked measurable. 15% talked about attainability. And 45% indicated that uh, relevancy was still missing and zero uh, indicated time bound. We had 77% of participants participating. Great, great. Well, this is fun using this polling option, so hopefully in future webinars we can continue to, to use it. And uh, as uh, all of you identified, it is time bound. Maybe we could have put in a specific date because, you know, September, is it the first of September or the end of September? We don't quite know that. But it's in pretty good shape. Um, many of you chose that it could use a little bit more clarity, and I would agree with that. We do have a few verbs uh, that do provide some clarity, like meet with organizations. 
Um, but it doesn't identify which organization. So maybe there could be a little bit more clarity. Are we talking the business sector, nonprofits, the faith community, or what types of organizations? Um, we're definitely not too certain if it is uh, um, measurable because we don't identify the number of organizations, and so that is certainly missing, which many of you identified as well. So are we talking about 15, 20, how many? And then therefore, we don't know if it's attainable. If, that, if, there, if there was some type of measurement system in there, if we had a number, we would be able to uh, internally identify, well, is that, are we being realistic with ourselves? You know, if, if we say a hundred organizations, you know, is, is that attainable? Or really, given our community and where we're at with our effort, maybe what's realistic is ten. So often, that attainable area is based on what you think is feasible and where you think you're at in your community. The other thing that uh, about half of you identified is that it doesn't seem relevant. Uh, or we're uncertain if it's relevant to our specific uh, policy priorities. So we're meeting with these organizations about what? Um, uh, you know, we, we might be able to assume that it's our policy priority, but as with many of the, the communities, your work is embedded within a larger coalition. And maybe you're meeting with these organizations about other activities that while important for a healthy community, have nothing to do with this policy priority uh, that you want them to focus on and want your community to focus on. So it's, it's unclear whether it's really relevant to uh, your policy priority or not. So uh, I think it, it, for the most part, we identified many of those aspects that are still missing in this draft of the objective. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Claudia uh, to continue to refine what this objective might look like. Okay, let's look at this next draft then of the SMART objective. By September 1st, 2014, the HCI leadership team will meet with at least four coalition partners to create a 12-month program and event schedule that will incorporate policy-supported education, mobilization, and advocacy. I want you all to think for a moment about whether this is a complete SMART objective. Indicate with the poll either yes or no. We'll give you just a moment to again look at this objective and formulate your answer either yes or no before Adrian starts the poll. Okay, Adrian, I think you can start it now. Okay, Adrian, would you like to close the poll and give us the results? Yes, we had 86 respond, 86 percent responded yes, and 14 percent no. Great. Next slide, then, Adrian, to answer that question. Again, I want to emphasize that the SMART objectives help your team see what needs to be done and the role they can play. Not only does the objective need to be clear and attainable, it must be relevant. So to give the correct answer, the answer is yes and no. Let's look at all the components. They are there. They are time-bound. 
It talks about who is going to be meeting and who they will be meeting with. It talks about what they will be creating. And it does give some relevancy. It talks about supportive education, mobilization, and advocacy. But that, how much clarity does it really give? Does it help to ensure that we are being efficient and that we are not planning all of our own? It does help that we are being efficient and that we're not planning all of our own events by meeting with partners to identify existing events. But with a closer look, does it really give your team a good picture of the plan beyond the schedule? Ask yourselves now if you can identify in this objective what gives greater clarity and relevancy within the community change framework to be productive, effective, and efficient. Because we all have limited time and resources, really spending time on thinking about effectiveness and efficiency when writing the objectives and plans makes sense. Before you answer, let's take another look at the community change framework. Next slide. Again, you and your team write the plan with objectives to give meaning to the community change framework actions. The community change framework, again, gives you your purpose to create an environment that supports community health policies. It also identifies the activities that, if implemented effectively, lead to an environment that supports the community health policy you have identified. So while the objective does have all of the SMART objective criteria, what is missing? Can you answer why it's yes and no now? We'll keep you guessing much longer. Adrian, the next slide. Think what's very obvious when you look at this objective First of all, if you think about having to write it into one of the community change framework activity sections, that you immediately see that it does not fit into one community change framework activity. So let's talk a little bit more about the objective. It's a start, but how well does it really contribute to a plan that directs the leadership team to zero in on, be effective with, and just as important, measure specific community change framework activities. To have a clear plan that is relevant and attainable and with everyone needing to keep an eye on resources expended, a plan needs activities that are not only productive but effective and efficient. And that starts with writing specific community change framework objectives. So now what does that look like? Let's look at an example of a community change framework specific objective on the next page. So with the last example, you do have an objective not to just create awareness at an event, but to recognize that you will need to identify activities that will educate and mobilize and create advocacy. However, it isn't specific about community change framework activities, so that doesn't go far enough. It isn't specific for whom or what education is planned, for example, to educate policymakers or recruit media. We wouldn't know by looking at that objective. It also doesn't identify how to measure education, mobilization, or advocacy. So now let's be more specific. Write objectives that specifically identify community change framework activities and measures. On this slide is an example of an objective written with the intent to mobilize community members. And that is by September 2nd, 2014, increased by three the number of community events at which there are activities to mobilize community members. Now, as you look at this objective, the next question that you might have is, can you be even more specific? 
The answer is yes. However, that can be addressed in the activities that you will identify to achieve your outcome. We realize you may not have all of the answers to the specifics of those activities right now as you write your plan, but identifying the intent to use community events for the purpose of mobilization is an important start in creating a clear plan. Let's look then at an example of one of the mobilizing activities we might have in mind that you would identify either now or in the future. This is the adaptive work that you're doing. This is specific to your policy priorities. Next slide. So with the objective again, the same objective written at the top of the screen, with this objective, you have a plan to do more than, again, as I said, create awareness at an event. Again, you have identified a plan in which you've written that an expected accomplishment is to mobilize community members at three community events. Again, we understand that not right now. You, right now, you may not be able to identify those three mobilization activities, but this objective provides the clear track for doing so. So now let's look at an example of how an activity at a community event can be the first step of mobilizing activity, followed by the second step, a walk by audit activity. So in this example, at a health fair, you have identified on a map of the city you would have attendees draw a line from where they live to the places they walk or bike, and then you would invite them to participate in a walk-bike walk, audit. Each of those steps built to the ultimate purpose for mobilizing community members, which is to write letters to the editor and contact their city council about implementing, implementing a master bike plan and, of course, being more active. This is just one mobilization activity example. The objective identifies that mobilizing activities will occur at three community events, and they may, those activities that occur at the events, may be just a start to a list of activities that you will need to take, accomplish, to accomplish your end goal of mobilizing community members. Now, the main webinar will focus specifically on mobilization in greater depth. And I want to emphasize again that events were only chosen as an example for this webinar. We do not expect that teams should write all or even a good number of your objectives based on events. Next slide. So let's look now at advocacy with decision makers. The objective as written would be by October 31st, 2014, increase by two the number of community events at which there are activities for advocacy with organizational decision makers. Again, we recognize that you may not know exactly what activities are planned, but you will need to identify and implement those activities before October 31st. So that does give your team a plan, a clear plan, of something that needs to be done. Now, on the next screen, let's look at an example of an activity at a community event that would lead to the advocacy that you seek. Once again, this is the adaptive work that is specific to your policy priority. Again, you may not be able to identify advocacy activities right now, but the objective provides the clear track for doing so. So again, with the objective, by October 31st, 2014, increase by two, 
the number of community events at which there are activities for advocacy with decision makers. The objective identifies the need to identify two advocacy activities at events. At the bottom of the slide, let's look at an example of how an activity at a community event can be the first step with creating advocacy. So the example given here is at a chamber coffee, share an employer caterer healthy catering success story and invite attendees to a meeting where they can learn more. The first step is just sharing an employer caterer healthy food success story. You should follow that then by inviting attendees to a meeting in which you can provide more information about the initiative for access to healthy food. Each of those steps builds to the ultimate purpose of advocacy of decision makers, which is either organizational policies and or decision makers advocating for the community initiative. Again, this is just one example of advocacy activity. Think about, as you are beginning to write your plan, what advocacy activities you can plan. Have these advocacy discussions in your leadership team, and if needed, plan TA time for additional help with this or any of the other community change framework activities. And I know, Scott, you have some other thoughts about this webinar and follow-up technical assistance. Next slide. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, in, in, if you're thinking about what's the process by which we can begin to draft our objectives, one potential process would be, if, you're, if you haven't uh, developed smart objectives before, would be to have members of your core leadership team and or others um, invited uh, to take um, you know, an hour, hour and a half, doesn't have to be long, to draft uh, some initial thoughts for your objectives that touch upon uh, the four areas of the community change framework. And I would strongly suggest that you develop objectives that touch upon all four of those so that you can have a complete portfolio, if you will, of objectives that relate to the four elements of the community change framework. So you might spend an hour or 90 minutes building upon some of your current efforts. Uh, as Claudia mentioned, we know that uh, having worked with you, that a lot of folks are interested in utilizing community events. So uh, we use that in example today, but we also know there's other efforts going on that could, uh, with a little bit of work and attention, be crafted into SMART objectives. So you spend that 60 or 90 minutes brainstorming and doing your best to develop draft one or draft two SMART objectives, and then I would suggest process-wise maybe having two, maybe three people at the most do the fine-tuning of those objectives, uh, not changing the, the heart of those objectives or the meaning of those objectives, but asking themselves, okay, do we really have a smart objective here? Going back to the slides uh, provided today, almost in a checklist fashion, are we, um, are we at a SMART objective yet? And then that can be shared back then with the, the larger um, uh, team. Certainly, as Claudia mentioned, uh, the TA team is uh, willing and available to review and provide our thoughts or ideas around uh, the SMART objectives that they're being drafted. Um, particularly for the HCI uh, two communities who have um, their grant applications due at the, end, or at the beginning of April, um, I would strongly suggest that you begin to draft those objectives and that we utilize at least part of your next TA call, if you have one between now and the beginning of April, uh, to spend some time in reviewing those SMART objectives or those current drafts that you may have developed. 
here in a minute on the next slide, I, uh, I want to do uh, take some time to open it up for any questions that you might have uh, utilizing the chat box uh, regarding SMART objectives. As you consider what questions you might have um, in preparation for this webinar, we developed several of our own. So maybe some frequently asked questions um, might be, how complete does the plan need to be? Should it be for one year or all three years? My initial thinking on that is uh, plan for one year. I think often right now it's very difficult to plan for more than one year, especially given the adaptive nature of this work. So I, I would strongly suggest that your objective, that time-bound nature, is within that next calendar year, or within that 12-month frame. Might be shorter than that, but I would keep them within that 12-month 12, 12 uh, frame. Will ACI 2 and 1 then both be writing SMART objectives each year for our grant report? Um, and yes, that is the, that is the intention. The, hope is that similar to the every other month uh, reporting that you are uh, doing, that you utilize these SMART objectives then during your TA calls throughout a calendar year or other meetings of your HCI core leadership team, that you're utilizing them as a way of kind of checking in with yourself about how are we progressing on our SMART objectives? And so it's an opportunity to, uh, uh, to touch base. How long term do objectives need to be? I think we probably covered that in the first question. And then how many objectives for each uh, CCF component or community change framework component? Uh, I alluded to that earlier is that I think you want a diverse portfolio, if you will. Uh, I would suggest uh, at least one objective for each area, community change framework component, but you may want to have several. I, I, I would be cautious of trying to have too many. So if you're finding yourself having five, six, seven objectives for one community change framework, I would really ask your leadership team um, you know, are those really action steps or can these be combined in some way to create uh, a fewer number of uh, attainable objectives? So uh, are there any other questions, initial questions about SMART objectives? And, and we did have a couple of questions come in, um, and the first one being um, for HCI2, we don't have community education listed on the report slash annual plan as on the framework model. Was this a misprint or on purpose? Yeah, this is Claudia. That's an excellent question. Um, on your semi-monthly tracking form and the report and annual plan, you know community education as either recruitment of media or earned media. So that is how it is to be reported. On the model framework itself, it does identify community education. So no, it is not a misprint on your annual plan. The second question is, as we provide objectives, do you want to see activities listed after them, if known? Another really good question, um, if you know some of those activities um, and can summarize them, uh, I think that it would be helpful to see those after the objectives, but we are not requiring that you place those activities there. And certainly do not expect a list of all of the tasks that you would need to take to complete that activity. I think the question posed is a good one for your leadership team to wrestle with. Do you want to see those activities? So do the leadership team, do you want to give yourself that guidance throughout the calendar year or throughout that time frame? 
if you see it as being helpful to utilize and have that level of detail, that's fine. Uh, recognizing, again, the work, it, it will be adaptive throughout a, a calendar year, and you're going to take advantage of opportunities that come up. So it, it is really up to you, that level of detail. Um, and that's a good question for your leadership team to, to wrestle with. Any other questions? If not, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is uh, useful to use the upcoming uh, technical assistance calls to touch base on uh, your drafts or the development of these. Um, I know I have a couple of communities I'm working with, I've uh, asked them, why don't you send something to me a day or two in advance, or Claudia and I are working with the community, send something uh, to us a day or two in advance so that we can have a more robust discussion on it during our, our TA call. So I would uh, recommend that you work with your TA providers uh, to get those developed and get those started. A few other uh, couple of uh, reminders, and I think we've touched upon these, and then we'll open the call or we'll open the telephone line so that we can hear from Carolyn and others in Stafford uh, about their leadership efforts um, uh, in their community. So a few other just uh, FYIs. Again, this is uh, the development of the SMART objectives are an organizing tool for you to touch base upon throughout a calendar year and will be helpful to us as a TA team to touch base with you throughout that calendar year as well. Um, as Claudia mentioned, it's an opportunity, SMART objectives provide a, a way of developing a cohesive plan to move that work um, into efficient and effective work. I know a lot of times on community initiatives, you can feel like you're getting pulled and tugged and drawn into a lot of different areas. And SMART objectives allow your uh, leadership team to stay focused on what's most important to make progress on your policy priorities. As we mentioned, start drafting, and I'll emphasize the word drafting SMART objectives. I, I think it's really helpful just to take a first pass of them, put them away, come back to them. Um, and, and then rework them to uh, uh, help them become stronger, smart objectives. And as we mentioned, use those TA team calls to discuss and get any type of help needed. Claudia, do you have anything uh, else to add uh, for us to keep in mind before we uh, have a conversation with staffers? No, I, I think that you've covered it well, Scott. I, I would just say that what our hope is that you're creating something, again, that aren't just words on the paper, but something that really is helpful to your team. Great. With that, um, Carolyn, I want to make sure that your mic is open. And uh, before you start commenting about the, the great work that you're doing in your county, I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of framework for what we're looking for, uh, similar to what we would have had in the previous call. So Carolyn or others, are you there? We are. Can you hear us? Yes. Great to hear your voice. Is it sunny and warm in Stafford? No, it's not. <laughs> oh we, want, God. We, we want Monday back. <laughs> All right. Well, it's that time of the year, right, where some of us have a little bit of warmth, some of us it may be cloudy, and we are definitely all wishing for warmer weather, I think, and seeing those spring temperatures. So, uh, so uh, thanks for joining us on the call again uh, this month, and we're excited to, to have you here and to hear a little bit more about what you're experimenting with uh, with the leadership competencies and how that's helping you make progress on your policy priority. And so if you can uh, give us a, a few minutes of the context of the work, so those who may not be familiar with what's happening, take a minute or two to give us a, a bit of an overview of that. 
what your adaptive challenge has been, maybe a minute or a minute and a half on what is your adaptive challenge, and then what leadership competencies or behaviors did you begin to experiment with to address that adaptive challenge? If you want to take two or three minutes to talk about those leadership competencies and what you deployed and what you tried and experimented with. And then most importantly, the final question for the framing is what you've learned from those experiments and uh, how that may guide your work going forward. So that uh, hopefully provides a little bit of framing for, um, uh, for what you have to present about what's been happening in Stafford. So I'll turn it over to you to, uh, to answer those couple of questions. Okay, well, I'll take a stab at it. I guess first thing I feel like I need to say is that you know we're we're happy to be sharing today, but it's not because we feel like we've got answers. It's more in that spirit of you know learning from each other. I I kind of I like hearing what others' experience is. Sometimes I find it reassuring to know that others are maybe in a similar stage that I am, or um, the ideas that I can take and either emulate or or adapt um, can be useful. So it's in that spirit that, that we're sharing. We certainly don't feel like we are um, an example of one that's got it all figured out. But the context here, um, we're a countywide initiative and working in three different towns. Um, none of them, either the county or the cities, have um, engaged before in any type of comprehensive planning process, um, much less something that's specific to uh, active living. And I guess by way um, of background too, the the object or the, the thing that our community has decided that they want to focus on is adopting master walk bike plans in, in the three major towns in our county. Um, so what I would consider in our adaptive challenges, um, just uh, Having this become more ingrained in people's everyday activity, um, in in the way that they they live their lives, they run their organizations, and not only the time but the financial commitment that goes along with um, making this um, lifestyle a priority. So um, that's that's the adaptive challenge. Uh, we have people that are, are willing to sit on committees and do specific activities and so forth, but I'm not sure yet we've gone as far as we can in, in really making the cultural shift. Mm -hmm. um, that was the next thing I was going to hit on. Um, so with that idea that we have some big lofty goals in mind adaptive-wise, some of the things that we kind of work through are deciphering at any given time what's adaptive work and what's a project, and knowing that we don't want to get too project-oriented, and yet we come back to needing specific goals, just like we're talking about today. There's specific activities that we need to do, and sometimes they kind of look like projects. So um, I guess just constantly having some awareness of, of why we're doing what we're doing so that we can kind of make sure that we aren't drifting too far from our adaptive work as we do those activities is something we're giving some thought to. Um, thinking about leadership competencies, um, one that we've talked a lot about is the need to energize others, um, to broaden the, uh, the, the people, the, the group, the base of people that are actively engaged in this. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, that's, I think, very tied to the idea that we're trying to uh, um, achieve some cultural change. We've got to get other, more and more people actively energized in this. So um, I think I'll focus on just one thing that we have put some work into of late. Um, we're mm -hmm. organizing in conjunction with... Uh, the USD 350 Education Foundation, a color run. We're calling it Color Me Lucky because it's certainly inspired by the, the color runs, but um, not an officially sanctioned one. We're kind of just doing it on our own. But Color Me Lucky run. Um, 
I think that we might have, without kind of giving some thought even to today's webinar on, on exactly how to tie it to some SMART objectives, um, we might have in, organized an activity that um, involved people in the community but didn't go as far as it could have in terms of being, um, especially that R, that relevant. How do we tie it back to our policy priority, which is that we want to have um, an actual formal master walk bike plan in each of our communities. So um, one of the, some of the things we've thought about that we, you know, even as we've, we've been brainstorming today during, or you know, we've been writing notes to each other during this, this webinar, but as we have people register at the, the run, they'll be in the lobby of our county annex, which is a place that we can um, put up signs that not all, that, that tell them, you know, we're trying to make that this a community where we can walk, we can enjoy walking every day, not just during a specific event. Will you help us? Uh, we have laminated signs that we have, not signs, I'm sorry, laminated maps that we've used in some of our leadership team meetings as we have mapped out um, proposed paths to improve through our town. Well, we might put those up in the lobby and ask for people's comments on them or um, schedule a specific walking event in the future, or maybe a family walk night. We've already done a walkability assessment in each of the towns. We didn't have as wide a participation as we might have hoped. Maybe this is an opportunity to um, do it again and, and have more people feel like that they have been more directly involved in it um, as we go and propose that, that plan to our city council at some point in the future. Um, we have a video that we've developed and um, incorporating that into our, our day with our color run might be something that we could do to make this more smart and yeah. um, having yard signs along the route that again try to tie the idea that today's fun activity really does connect to what we're trying to do to improve our town forevermore might make it more smart. Yeah. So, I don't my know, assumption, my rambling. My assumption, too, Carolyn, is that such an event probably gets pretty good exposure in the community, whether you have a community newsletters or a newspaper or anything like that. Something like that's going to hit those pages. It, would I be correct in that assumption? I think so. We've, um, yeah. we've already, I mean, it, it's not maybe by the context of some towns, a big event. Um, we were hoping for 50, and we've got, I think, over 100 signed up at this point. And we've got the awesome. education, the, the school promoting it with us. Um, and so uh, thinking of the SMART objectives, as the opportunity to utilize that media exposure on the event to point that individual reporter, whoever does, covers the story, if you will, about the larger issue of a, a walk bike master plan for the county would continue to reinforce the message, just like you mentioned that county annex, utilizing that staging area as an opportunity to educate, allowing people to sign up if they're interested maybe about the larger issue, it sounds like. It, am I correct in that, that utilizing the media in that way? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we're fortunate we have a, a newspaper editor that personally finds this um, valuable and interesting, and he prints pretty much everything we tell him, or we ask him to. <laughs> if we write it, he'll pretty much publish it. Oh, that's great. A great ally, then, to have as part of um, the, the team to get um, both pre-exposure as well as post-after-the-event type exposure. I'd be interested, as you mentioned, that uh, leadership competency of Energize Others, and like many um, uh, counties in Kansas, there's a few um, towns or communities that are kind of the hubs, if you will, whether it's three, two, or four. How have you gone about energizing others, or what's been your experience in trying to energize others county-wide uh, where you have maybe uh, 
people who live in those different communities could represent different factions uh, just by the nature of, well, it's not in our city or it's not in our town, it's in the one that's 15 miles away. What's, this, what's been your experience in trying to energize kind of across those quote unquote city factions that might exist in the county? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, se several of the people that are on our leadership team have a, a hat that they wear that um, crosses city lines. You know, in the Economic Development Office, our role is countywide, um, as is the Health Department's role. They've been active with us. Um, and I don't know if I... Well, we, I, I'd say that a lot of the people that, that are involved um, tend to be broad thinkers. So um, even like a couple of our school nurses, they have a role that's pretty specific within their town. But as we talk through um, the objectives of improving community health, they are big thinkers. I think probably we've been more city focused right now just because it's probably more attainable than trying to get, oh, you know, a master plan through the county or something like that. I don't know if that answers the question, but... Um. Well, I, I think so, and I appreciate how you say, you know, I think any county or any community who says, oh, we've got this all figured out is, is probably kidding themselves because it is ongoing work. And so I think what you sounded like what you were... Um, trying to do to energize others and reach across those factions is identify some individuals on your core leadership team that have a county perspective, whether their job represents that, like a county health official or somebody from the county health department, or just people, like you mentioned, the school uh, person from the school who may just have a broader, more than my organization perspective. So this, right. thanks for, for, yeah, thanks for, for answering that. And anything else you want to add, Carolyn, or if you have any others there about some of the, the work that you're doing in, in Stafford and trying to energize others? Um, I don't have anything else right now that's, that seems I don't know. I don't have anything else to add right now. I mean, we're, yeah. we're still learning. We're st <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I feel like we've got well, a lot of people who um, like the concept, are supportive yeah. of us in, um, in concept, but we've just got to get them more actively involved. Get them to put yeah, a little more aim. Yeah, I, it, it sounds like I think you alluded to earlier that culture shift where, you know, right now if I hear you, it sounds like, you know, they're responding, yes, I agree with these ideas maybe in, the, in, the, in their brains, but you're hoping over time it also soaks into their hearts and their souls where it hits them in a cultural way and has a level of kind of commitment to um, this overall effort um, in those ways as well. So you say it so it, well. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, hey, thanks for joining us uh, today on the call. And hopefully it, throughout uh, future calls, we're hoping to utilize uh, both the polling as well as opportunities for connecting with communities about their exper experiments in utilizing the, the leadership framework or uh, the community change framework. There are a few more uh, kind of housekeeping items about upcoming events and deadlines that we do want to touch upon. So I'm going to turn it back over to Adrian uh, for a final uh, couple of extra points to make on those items. Great. Thank you very much. Um, just a couple of quick comments. We have some deadlines coming up. The semi-monthly tracking form report is due March 15th, which happens to be Saturday um, of this month. We also have the HCI2 implementation grant applications are due April 
first, including the community match. Um, HCI1 match letter is due to Kansas Health Foundation on June 1st, and the HCI1 grant status report and the annual plan are due August 1st. Um, events coming up for webinars, we will have no April webinar next month due to the Active Transportation Workshop, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And then the May webinar on May 14th will focus in on community mobilization strategies. So we'll take a little bit of what we talked about today and dig a, d a little bit deeper around community mobilization. The Active Transportation Workshop is April 9th. It will be in Wichita. And um, many, I think everyone has received an invitation and some detailed information about that. Just wanted to call it to your attention again. The 11 HCI teams with active transportation policy priorities can bring four people. Um, you may bring more at your own cost. An email, Vicki sent an email to the team. She's asking you to register by March 26th. The event will be held at the hotel at Old Town and Conference Center um, in Wichita running from about 9 in the morning till 3.30 in the afternoon. Please call the hotel directly to hold a room uh, for April 8th if you need one on your credit card. And once you check in, the room will be direct billed to the Kansas Health Foundation. And if we, if, if we do have space available, the access to healthy food teams who have others in the communities that are interested are um, able to attend. OK. Well, thank you all very, very much. We appreciate your time and attention today. And uh, we look forward to talking with you soon. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.